That's because I'm in my high chair. Good morning, good morning. Dr. Ruth Anderson here with Enlightened World Network. I believe we're live. Terry, we're live? We're live. We're live. <laughs> good. And never know. Um, we are here to do our last installment of Mimi's Diner. I'm here with Deb Goldberg, Terry Angel, Mark Bianchi, and Robert Painley. We're so excited to be here in this space together, and we welcome you to join us. The idea behind Mimi's Diner came at Lester's Diner in Fort Lauderdale. There we were sitting, having breakfast, talking about the foods that we were eating, how we had decided on the foods we were eating, our own body image, and how, truly how we flog ourselves daily for what it is that we eat and how we had done that for years and years. And we decided that probably a lot of you would be having the same conversation with us if you were in the room. So we invited you into the room. And then Mark and Robert reached out and said, y'all know this isn't just a female thing. <laughs> this actually impacts males too. So we thought, okay, bring it in guys. So <laughs> here we are to have this conversation and I'm so pleased that you all are here. So well, thank you. Um, Robert and Mark are both hosts here on EWN. Robert's got his show, Spirit Focus. Mark is um, debuting his show called Mindfulness and having to do with financial matters and um, life planning, really, for living your best life. So I'm so excited. So we're just going to dig into this. So for the last two weeks, we've been sharing how society has really done a number on us. And it's, you know, it's not a new thing, right? I mean, it's been going on for eons that how women view themselves has everything to do with how they look physically, right? Their value in the world is based on their looks. Yeah, and so, you know, we've been kind of deconstructing that. And you all are saying, that's how it is for men too. So what have you all experienced? And of course, we can't speak for all women. And I know you guys can't speak for all men. But what has it been like for you growing up in this body? And what have been the cultural expectations of who you should be? You want me to go first? Or? Sure. Well, so one of the things that I think is really important here for people to understand is that you know, we're gay men. So we're going to have a little bit maybe different perspective than there would be if it was this, were straight males. Because I did do some research uh, before we began this and uh, before we had this show, just to make sure that I could bring in a little bit more of the, the heterosexual male perspective as well. Uh, so that wasn't, this wasn't all about us. But the interesting part is, is that men too, the, the statistics are that two out of five men have body shaming issues. And that's a, a large percentage for men, because when you think of men, we think of men as being strong and, 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 but we're taught that way from a very young age. The first thing, you know, when we're, when men are born, when boys are born, typically, uh, that's where gender identity starts to come in. And you, you, the first toy is usually a truck or a car or a, or a little toy gun or something. And if we, if a, a boy tends to grab a doll, for example, most parents try to say, well, he'll grow out of that or don't play with that, that girls play with that. So you're taught from a very young age as a male to not play with certain things, to not do certain things or boys don't cry. If we, if we, if we slip and scrape our knee, you know, boys don't cry. Uh, and so that part of um, growing up really affects men later in life. And all of those little things from the time that we're, from the time we're born on how men are supposed to create, if they're supposed to live our lives or how we're supposed to feel, gets put in a bit of a box. And sometimes that turns into toxic mas masculinity as we grow older. And so um, for me personally, you know, one of the things that I think I, I found too that it was interesting from a male perspective is women, the, as BMI for women, as the body mass index for women increases directly, there's a direct proportional, uh, 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 you know, uh, there's a direct portion out, proportionality correlation. to correlation, correlation to um, the, how women start to get bullied 
uh, for their looks. So the, the, as you get 10, 10 pounds or then 20 pounds or 30 pounds or 40 pounds, that bullying exponentially gets larger for women. And it's a direct correlation between BMI and the amount of bullying. With men, it's actually different. With men, there's actually a U curve. So for men, there's kind of a, a, male, uh, a male kind of ideal that men are supposed to stay in. So what happens with men is that men, when they start to gain weight, they will get bullied. But also if men lose too much weight, we start to get bullied. So too thin is bad for a male because you don't live up to the ideal. And too heavy for an ideal is, is also just as bad. So men have this U curve that you kind of have to stay in the middle of not to get bullied, where women, there's a direct proportion to uh, an uplifting curve. Just the more you gain, the more that, that, that you get bullied. And I found that interesting. I knew that it kind of I think Mark and I, when we talked about this, kind of knew that to be the case, but we never really thought about it in those terms. And it's interesting. I didn't think about it that way at all. You mm -hmm. know, and that was a, that was an interesting perspective and, and really true. And I don't think women women deal with it exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. No, we we can be as thin and you know gaunt <laughs> as yeah, exactly. <laughs> but what's funny with women is sometimes what's funny the women in our lives. You know, I'll oh we'll we we'll sitting down and sometimes. You know, uh, uh, you know, I, I, my sister was a size two, and this is, I don't know if she was a uh, size two, but she, you know, so another female would walk in the room and, and she would automatically almost a disdain if they were skinnier than she was. <laughs> you know, that is like, you know, oh, well, you know, who is she that, you know, flaunting that size zero, <laughs> you know? And it's kind of funny how women, I think, look at one another as opposed to men. Men, we size each other up a little bit more. I think where women look at how they look and how they're put together and their makeup and other things where men kind of size each other up a little bit more uh, for do they meet the standard or not. Um, so it's an interesting view from, uh, from, from men how we look at this topic as opposed to women. And I never really would have thought about that until we actually sat down to actually think about it and how we judge men, our, our own selves, how we grew up. I mean, I'll give one, one example is uh, when I was very young, um, I loved figure skating. I as watched the Olympics and it was something that I was fascinated by. I thought that's how I want to express myself. And so this is, you know, I want to, I want to take lessons, mom, dad, can I go take ice skating lessons? And my parents in the, you know, seventies were like, no, because that wasn't considered to be a sport that, um, they, you know, my, my son's not going to be a figure skater, my, my child, and I don't blame my parents for that. They were basically trying to save me from the cheat, the, the, the bullying and the, the jeers from, you know, kids my age who wouldn't have understood, or there, you know, that's a, that's a girl sport, you know, girls do ice skating and figure skating. That's not a men thing to do, uh, a male thing to do. So, um, so they were trying to save me, but I also, I know for my own life, that's something that I really, I think would have been good at. And I love and still to this day watch. And I have a friend, Rudy Galindo, who, you know, won the national championships. Um, and there, there's, there's something about that, that really sang to my soul, but I wasn't able to sing in that way. And so, you know, maybe as we, as we grow older here, as I, as I find more free time, maybe it's something that I can do to, you know, maybe just skate for myself in the future, just to get that out in some way and live through that. But I wasn't able to live that. And that's just one example of, of something that happened to me in my personal life. And there's a video of me ice skating with Robert that could be put on uh, America's Funniest Videos. Maybe we'll have to air that someday. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, what was it like for you? I had a slightly different, um, I can relate a little bit to what Robert said, but I've, I've yo-yoed my entire life, like that 20 or 30 pounds. I, I always uh, identified with that line from the Bridget Jones movie. And I've always been a little bit, a little, I always have that extra 15 pounds or whatever that line was. You know, that's been my, like the story of my life. Um, and I've, I've, I've go through phases depending on like just how I feel and what I'm inspired by and all that, where I'll work out a little bit, then I slack off, then I'll, I'll put on 20 pounds, then I'll go get into it again. And I'll, so I yo yoed. But what, one of the things I want to call out, and I think this applies to men and women, is I've always, I'm, I'm always very observational and my perceptive and intuition abilities are always kicked into high gear my whole life. Um, and so one of the things I've always noticed is how people just react differently to you when you're when you're looking good you know I've always noticed that they, they throw you a lot of you get a lot of benefit of the doubt when you're when you're looking you know up to par and when you're 
when I've let myself go a little bit, I've noticed like that, you know, it, it changes, it just changes. I just noticed that the way um, society treats you just slightly differently, gives you a little bit more, um, I don't know, I would call it airtime. <laughs> I think what's funny, I, you know, directly to what Mark's saying is, I was 125 pounds all my life. Uh, when, you know, up from when I was in, you know, in high school and into college and my first job, I could never gain weight. I was one of those people that, you know, I was so hyper and I was so active that I just could not put on weight at all. And so I was always considered that skinny guy, but, you know, I had a good job and I could wear a suit and it covered up and it gave me some bulk and something. So nobody really talked about that. Um, but it wasn't until years later where <laughs> metabolism starts to slow down as you age. Uh, that I was able actually to start to put on some weight. And what's funny is I started going to the gym and it was amazing how people tried to hit on you because now you look more like the ideal, particularly in the gay aspect of things, you know, going to the gym and having more of a fit body. Um, I, I think one of the things that I found too in my statistic looking, uh, <laughs> statistic viewing yesterday um, was that, you know, gay men account for... Uh, 5% of um, the population. So, you know, if, if you look at gay men as having about 5% of the general US population, but they account for 42% of eating disorders. So there's a huge correlation in the gay community between how you look and that weight as opposed to the heterosexual male community in this country and, you know, and, and body image. So for us being gay men, when you're paired up, it doesn't matter as much. Obviously, we don't go to bars. I haven't been to a bar in a decade, but, but or, you know, so, you know, it, it's different because we can relax a little bit. But the moment anybody that we know, you know, the first thing that anybody does that we know that's our age that breaks up, the first thing that happens is everybody's back in the gym. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing because, you know, again, through the research is, um, you know, when they find somebody that's overweight gets, you know, approaches somebody in a, a bar scene or to try to look for a, potential partner, there's a rebuff in the community against uh, against men who don't fit that ideal. And it's not, I mean, it, it, through all of the memes that I get and stuff from friends, you know, uh, it, it's funny how you can't, you know, they're, 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 you, know they, they, you know, how you pinch an inch kind of thing. Uh, you know, there'll be a photo of somebody pinching, you know, a quarter of an inch and it's like, oh, I'm obese in the gay community. And it's, it's, it's disconcerting and it's um, it's an unfortunate um you know uh, uh, way of life but it really stems from uh the the advent of aids in a, in a large sense a large sense because back when hiv and aids came onto the scene in the early 80s mid 80s um, one of the first things that happened was that people wasted and that wasting aspect of aids where people became gaunt and lost weight and then eventually succumbed to aids itself um, that was a scary tipping point for gay men. So one of the things that gay men started to do was start to bulk up, lift, eat as much as you can to put on as much weight as we possibly could and look as healthy as we could so that uh, we wouldn't look, quote unquote, look sick, right? Uh, and you didn't want to have that look. And that carried from the 80s into the 90s until the advent of, you know, uh, you know uh, different types of drugs that could sustain uh, HIV, where you could, if you were HIV positive, you could live a relatively normal life, keeping the, the, the disease in check. But, you know, coming from an age where we saw people dying, you know, on a daily basis, or you would go to a bar, not see somebody for a couple months, and the next time you saw them, they'd lost 40 pounds. And, you know, um, it, it really stuck in the gay cultural mindset uh, for particularly men our age who went through that. Uh, uh, when you start to see somebody going that direction, you kind of knew that something was wrong and terribly wrong. And I think we really tried to go overboard and combat that, that, uh, that stigma uh, so that, you know, uh, people outside, both gay in the gay community and outside wouldn't notice that, that, that aspect of, of our lives. Wow, that, that is so interesting. You guys are, I didn't realize how hard you guys are on yourselves. <laughs> we are. No it's idea. a surprise. I don't think most women know, you know, no. that we go through some of these similar issues. No, but you know, Robert, you were talking about as a woman's BMI goes up, the body mass index, for those of you that don't speak in initials, um, <laughs> that the bullying goes up. But here's what I think folks, men may not realize. 
the women bullying themselves mm -hmm. is massive. Mm -hmm. And it it isn't just, oh, I'm fat, I'm fat. All of a sudden I become stupid and I become um, having less value. Okay. And it's a total mind trip. Do, you, do guys do that too? Or is it really just, I'm fat, I'm fat, I'm fat? I think we we all do that. Like um, what I what I just said about I've noticed, you know, when I've looked really good and I'm working out, I notice people are just they they. I think people automatically um, attri uh, attribute positive um, aspects to a person based on their looks and based on their how fit they are and all this kind of thing. They make all these assumptions that well, they must have all these wonderful inner qualities as well. Just based on like an outward appearance, I think I think everybody does that to everybody. Um, I I but I do think there are gender differences, and I do think I think women have it. I think women have it considerably harder. Um, I think gay men are more aligned with women, but I would I would in my opinion I think that um, women and gay men probably have it the toughest as far as that whole. Thing I, goes. I think I, I think he's right because I think that the you know either you're fat and lazy. Or, or big and stupid, you know, as it's kind of because as I got as I started to bulk up and I started to be, you know, get that bodybuilder look, people didn't care about what I had to say. People just cared about how I looked. Uh, it's like, you know, look at great bro, you know, and and get that like you're an idiot. It be, it's, like, it's having now having to try to convince people that there's a mind behind the muscle, you know, because people think that with muscle comes you know, a lack, of, a lack of intelligence. You know? lack of words. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, I grunt at the gym and I, you know, I have nothing else to offer. Um, so it's interesting from a male perspective that we too, you know, women may you, you know, get that dumb connotation too with it, but we get it from, you know, being that, that muscle jock image too, that, that comes with really bulking up that, you know, that you, 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 you only think about the gym and you only think about what it takes to lift, you know, a weight from point A to point B and not that you have anything else behind of substance behind there. So I don't think that's the case in all the time, but I do no. think women have it, you know, I've seen as a manager of maybe 50, 60 people in the workplace, I would hear the comments of that, you know, not, not only men back in the day, not so much anymore, but men back in the day, how they would treat women differently as almost subservient in the workplace, because I grew up in an era where, you know, women could still be patted on the behind and things of this nature before the Me Too movement, but this we're going back 20, 30 years in the work environment, how that's changed for us. And seeing our, my old boss, for example, who was in his 60s, 30 years ago, how he treated a secretary and this sort of thing. Um, but now, but I still hear it and it's unfortunate. I actually hear it more from women toward women than I hear it men toward women. Men in the workplace will, at least if they feel that way, will keep it in check because they know they can be fired or something for it. But women don't seem to have that ability, like they won't get fired, I don't think, in the workplace for body shaming another woman. You know, it's kind of this, this sometimes a cattiness out there when I hear it in the hallway or I hear it between women. And it's, sad because I see so much out in social media about women supporting one another. I hear it a lot, and but I don't see it as much as I hear it. It would be nice to be seen more that women actually support each other the way that I, I see on social media how women want to be treated, but then it just seems sometimes that they don't live up to that standard sometimes. And it's unfortunate that, that, uh, that women can't be more supportive of one another. Why do, you, why do you think that is? As women, why do you think that sometimes, you know, the ideal is out there, but sometimes it, it, it's, not, it's not being adhered to? Or sometimes the cattiness, like, yeah. really it can just be so over the top. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I tend to think it's how you feel about yourself. If you, if you are feeling good about yourself and you, love yourself and are able to love other people, they're not the ones that are going to be catty, right? I think the people that are miserable in their own existence or uncomfortable in their own skin that will gun for somebody else to make themselves feel better. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And bullying in general, that's, you know, that's the, the general premise behind it. And I think when people are stressed, and here we are living in incredibly stressful times, and looking for people, people are looking for ways to feel better, you know. And unfortunately, when you get into stress, when everybody's happy at a party, nobody, you don't hear the cattiness. 
It's when somebody walks in who's in a bad mood or something that starts to go after. But unfortunately, other people start to chime in, I think, at that point and, you know, start to whisper behind somebody's back and, and do these things. But, I, you know, when, when everybody's happy or people are in a better mood, you don't see it as much. People are much more accepting of one another when you come from a place of love and light and happiness and joy. Uh, as opposed to anything that's negative. You know, that and negative and, and it, it only starts takes, with self-love. Yeah, it only takes one person to be negative that can change the dynamic of an entire conversation or a room. Or, I mean, we could have come on here and just, if we started, you know, attacking each other or other gay men or we're putting people down, it would have changed the tenor and tone of the conversation. But the reality is, is again, what you're trying to do here and what we're trying to do is put a light out there to some of these issues that men, we don't think about this on a daily basis. You kind of don't, you go through your life without thinking about how this can be impactful. And if there are parents out there who have young boys or young girls, you know, in this day and age, it's okay for them to identify or play with certain types of toys and let them explore and tell, you know, not tell boys anymore that you can't cry, you know, and stifle their emotional growth, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because this hurts them later on in life. It, it causes them to have poor relationships typically. Uh, they become mean, they become they can become bullies, they can have all of these negative traits of toxic masculinity that they don't understand they're instilling. They're trying to, you know, put their children in a light of having a normal quote unquote life. Uh, but you know that that their view of normal life of what's of what's germane to a, a masculine or a feminine identity needs to change so that we could all just be, grow up to have, be emotionally stable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And it's, it's those that have that insecurity inside that are going to do the bullying, like you were saying. You know, if I don't feel good about myself, I'm gonna find something about you that I'm, I can make myself feel good about mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and tear you down with my words. So the, the verbal abuse is so hard because those scars are on the inside. And that's, yeah. that's what happens with a lot. Especially, with and especially if it happened as a child. Yes. You carry that through your whole life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, I also think that, you know, we, what comes with all of us is generationally transmitted programming. And if you go way back in time, women were competitive to get married and to be chosen because that was the only way that they were going to be protected and had some wealth, um, housing. Um, and, and so I think women had to be very competitive back then and had to look a certain way so that they would be chosen. And so all of these ideas have still come down through generation after generation after generation that um, I don't have to compete anymore. Times have changed. I can be my own being and know that I'm enough, but that takes a lot of work on understanding self-worth uh, mm -hmm. and, and knowing who you are that I don't have to compete with another woman, we, a female anymore. But those lineages of thought are still very strong. The same way you're talking about how boys are raised versus how girls are raised. It is all passed down ideas that are outdated and they don't work anymore. And they, I don't think they were helpful in creating self-worth or self-esteem or understanding your own value. And what's sad is still a lot of children today are raised that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what what breaks that cycle? At what point do we get to a point where, you know, we don't you look at the clothes in the 80s, the big shoulder pads and everybody looking bigger and looking, you know, it, it's that that imposing figure, you know, and what's happening in our society today is so what's, you know, this whole aspect of all these superheroes, what we've seen with men in the gym and Mark and I worked out for a long time and gone to a lot of gyms in, in our life. And what we see is this, you know, this trend now that men have to be gigantic. We have to live up to this, you know, this, you know, this transformer Star Wars, you know, superhero standards of looking immense now to have this view and it's still a subculture but it does exist you know i see you know the, you see uh, 
Halloween costumes and things where they're all Superman or Batman or this thing, and they're all with, you know, hyper stuffed muscles and things like this. And what do you think that does to a little boy who sees only that? That's his view of how what a man should look like. Much yeah. like women had the ideal of Barbie, where you had to have this completely disfigured body to look normal in some capacity, <laughs> you know, or the ideal of a woman. Uh, and, you know, both of those views are unrealistic and in most cases unattainable. And you, ch you spend your whole life trying to get there and you're always disappointed. And so you set yourself up in life to be, you know, to be depressed because you can't get there. And that comes out in an eating, which then tends to make you heavier because you're depressed. And there's uh, this whole cycle that that's where it ties in to the lashing out and the toxic masculinity, I right. think. It's that repression of that and in men in particular, not knowing how to process those emotions and those feelings and therefore lashing out. And that's where I think the toxic masculinity ties in. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Totally agree. All do, you right. see it, do you see it changing for women, Deb, for example? Do you see that and like over the course of the last 30 years, do you see, you know, in your general life, you know, and, and I guess it was, you know, for obviously Ruth and, and Terry as well, but have you seen, uh, uh, you know, how that body image has worked for women in the last 30 years or so? I, I don't see much of a change. Um, I think that it's such a, a growth in doing, um, doing deeper work inside of yourself and really understanding who you are. And then from that, when I call that a connection to God and getting your worth and value from knowing who you are, on a divine perspective, and then incorporating that into how you perceive your own body. Because uh, somebody had said the other day, and I thought this was great, because we get taught this, we're not the body. When, when you're looking at, at a divine perspective, you taught you, I am not the body, but I have a body. Mm -hmm. Those are two different things. Sure. I am not the body, but I have a body. And I thought that is such a great way to mm -hmm. understand who you are. And then to move forward from that, one of the experiences I had with goddess <laughs> is I love clothes and, and I would be, I, I was going on an interview one day and I was looking through my closet going, oh my God, what, what am I going to wear? Because I need to look good. I want to look good for this interview as if that's what's going to get me hired is how I look. Mm -hmm. And so I spent two weeks with the goddess hanging out with me every day and teaching me that I, the clothes don't make me beautiful. I make my clothes beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it was such a True. shift in my understanding that it is, it's, it's our light. Our light makes us beautiful, not what you're putting on the body. Um, and, and it's your inner being. But I don't see a whole lot of growth for women as a whole. I'm talking about in a generalization sure. that there's still so much competition and bullying within your own self as to that you're not good enough. It's still part of that I'm not good enough thing. You know, Diana made a great point. She, there's a comment on here. And she said, I think that people also react differently when you were talking about how people act when you've lost weight or you've gained weight by the energy that we carry. So if we don't feel good about ourselves, we carry an energy that detracts from our truth and people respond in a negative way. It's more of the energy that we ex exude than the outside appearance from her experience, which yep, is- I agree with that. It's yep. the mirror. You're seeing a mirror of your own thoughts and consciousness outside of you. And then people are reacting to you in the way that you feel about yourself. You're mm -hmm. seeing how your own, what your own thoughts are. You know, I lose weight and I'm like, oh, I feel great. I look great. Oh, now everybody's telling me I look great. But yep. if you really think about it, what was wrong with me before? <laughs> like, oh, I'm, I look, I'm great now. I'm awesome. But when I was 10 pounds or 20 pounds heavier, I wasn't awesome, right? <laughs> Nobody says Apparently, anything right? to you, right? If you don't tell yourself you're still great when you're 20 yeah. pounds overweight, right? So it is, it is a really, uh, it's a deeper understanding that you're getting reflected back to you 
of how you feel about yourself. I think you're absolutely yeah. spot on. I remember the, the mantra back in the day when I first started going to the gym a long time ago now. Uh, the, the mantra was, if you want to be with one of us, then become one of us. And it was that forced into get, you must look, they had this type of body to be of worth to them, you know, and, and, and unless you did that, they were going to ignore you. And it, it's still a little bit, I think, in the male mentality, a little bit uh, in the gay world anyway, I'd say, you know, and again, a generalization. Um, that there's still a lot of that that still exists out there, unfortunately. And, you know, people aren't looked at for who they are and their light and their intelligence and other things. You know, they're prejudged based on their body because, you know, the dating world has gone from, hey, we met in a bar and I get to see you, I get to experience you, I get to experience your light, to you're now just a picture on an app. And if you don't have a six pack or 12 pack, it's swipe left or what, you know, and it's, it's just that superficial. Uh, in a lot of instances. And, you know, when you maintain or you promote that type of superficiality, um, it's not going to change, I don't think. You know, there, there has to be an app where, hey, you know, it's kind of like what, what's the, the voice where you don't judge the person by the performance, you judge it on the actual voice of the individual. And if they're interested in your voice without seeing you, then they'll turn their chair so they can see, hey, that's the talent that I find interesting. I don't care about their look, their personality, their stage presence, or any of these other attributes. It's the voice is what's important here. I think until we get to a point where it doesn't really matter about the package, you could fall in love with any any soul that kind of matches or resonates with you or something of this nature without looking at the transport vehicle that moves that soul through this plane. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's where we have to get. But I don't, again, in our world, I don't see that happening anytime in the near future. As a gay man, though, I, I'm a little bit different. I mean, I, it's, it's part of why I, I never felt 100% like I fit in. Um, sometimes in gay circles and gay crowds, because I, I've always been one of those people that like, I always looked at what was inside of a person first. And that's always the first thing that drew me to a person. Um, and if they happen to look good, so great. If, if they weren't so great looking, so what, you know, if I connected with you on an emotional, mental, especially intellectual level, I love great, inspiring conversation. That's always you know, I would take someone like that over somebody who's all fluff on the outside, but not very much to offer on the inside. Um, and um, I substance just, outside. yeah, I, I, I think I've always been a little bit more into the substance. And I've seen and witnessed the, the comments firsthand, like, uh, you know, not to sound full of myself, but when I was in my 20s and 30s, I, I got a decent amount of attention when I was around other gay men. Um, and I've, I've actually like had gay men say to me, like, why are you hanging out with him or whatever, you know, because like, you know, you, why would you hang out with somebody that looks like that? You know, I mean, and it's like, what, you know, I just, I, I never got that. I never understood that. So, you know, mm -hmm. what was worth <laughs> until you met me and you had substance and style. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure they weren't talking about Robert. <laughs> I will self compliment. There you go. Okay. <laughs> but I think it's about like evolving and becoming more comfortable with yourself. Mm -hmm. And then you realize how superficial all that stuff really is because how long do you really stay young and beautiful? You know, to be realistically, to be hung up on that, you know, then you get the double whammy as you get older. Then you get the, the, the age thing and you've got the, the looks starting to, you know, because everything goes, gravity just pulls it all down, you know, as much as you try to fight it, you know, it, it just happens. And so you, I think that like the only way to really cope in a healthy way is to develop your inner person and be more comfortable with yourself. I don't see, I see it to be very, very frustrating to be fighting that battle still in your fifties and sixties and seventies. Mm -hmm. I, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, Mark, you were talking about 42% of eating disorders for men. Robert, yeah, it, 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 it's if, like gay men uh, comprise 5% of general population, but we account for 42% of eating disorders in this country. And that, you know, that just tells you the difference between gay men and heterosexual males, that they're 95% of the population, and they account for the 50, other 58% of those eating disorders. It's almost you know, for a, such a small minority of the population, we're almost 50% of the eating disorder problems in this nation. And that just talks about the 
the difference in body image between gay men and straight men uh, and the pressure that we put on ourselves to have that ideal body, it's way out of proportion with our proportionality to the general population as a whole. And, um, and it needs to change. But again, wait, I don't see that changing anytime soon either. Mm. Wow. You know, eating, eating disorders are from a lack of feeling out of control, feeling that you have no control in your life. Mm -hmm. and, and that is one way that people have learned as a coping mechanism to deal with, um, I can have control over what I put in my body or don't put in my body. And nobody can force me to do either or. And so it, it becomes a real self-destructive way of, um, of gaining control in your life. And it's, it's tied into so much emotional stuff, like what you're talking about, Absolutely. is of, of men not having the tools to emote, to be allowed to emote. And, and so the control has to happen somewhere of where I feel like, I, um, you know, everybody else is controlling me or um, family, friends, society, whatever it is. And I'm going to use this as a way of feeling like I have self-control. That one thing you can control, right. Yeah. But it is so self-destructive. The other thing too is men by percentage tend to find and seek help much less than women. Mm -hmm. Because again, it goes to that masculine image. I can do this by myself. I don't need help. That's not a manly thing to ask for help. And so men don't go out and seek that help. So when men have an eating disorder or all these issues, um, it becomes compounded because they won't seek the help that they need. It, that goes through, you know, loss of a loved one, not seeking support for loss in their life or any of these other issues were taught again. If crying is bad, you know, showing your emotions is bad, we're not going to seek the therapy and the help that we sometimes so desperately need uh, to have a healthy life. And that too needs to be changed through this programming that we receive as a, as a young child growing into manhood. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Totally agree. It's, um, it's really amazing. You know, we have statistics out there of, like you're saying, who shows up with an eating disorder and who gets counted. And men don't come forward the same way when there's sexual abuse involved in a male. They don't come forward either. There's like even a, a more of a stigma, even more than women have about being sexually abused as a male. So, so statistically, we don't really understand male problems because they're not coming forward. Most of my right. caseloads with people have been primarily women. Women will come forth and ask for help. And as more and more males start to come in, which they have, um, it's still not nearly the same percentage. Sure. Yeah, I, sorry, I, I was gonna say, we rarely heard about male rape mm -hmm. you know, and that that was a reality until a few years ago, actually, when it started coming out that, yeah, it does happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you would hear men, you know, that talked about it, like say that it was an embarrassment, they thought, mm -hmm. like to, to come forward because people would mock them like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, sure. You hated that. Like, like because they're a man or whatever, they were supposed to like mm -hmm. being raped, like some, you know, something bizarre thought process like that. Like you couldn't possibly be anti that because you're a man. Yeah. <laughs> I'll share from personal experience and something that only Mark and a couple of people know. I, when I was again, was, was smaller into my forties. I was like 135, 125, 135 pounds at that time. And I actually was attacked uh, in that way uh, with a big guy that I started to date and uh, wasn't, all of a sudden he became, his, his eyes went cold, black as coal and he just became incredibly aggressive. And I actually, I was, uh, I actually had to start screaming and neighbors had to call the police because I was in the I kind of, you know, I, I felt like I put myself in that situation, but it wasn't me. I had to really get through. I didn't seek therapy for it. I was nothing happened that, I mean, I wasn't right. Let's put it that way. But I was attacked where that would have happened had I not been able to get away. Uh, it was that scary. And from that process, I knew I had to protect myself. So whether that was through, you know, uh, you know, studying karate or just getting bigger. Now I'm a little bit more imposing and, it, and people would think twice before they tried to do that to me. So it really had an effect on me, but I did seek 
help for it. And nothing like nothing seriously happened. I wasn't violated in that way, but it was enough of a violation that it was a huge wake up call for me as a, as a person and, and what I think I should do. And I didn't find it, it really, when I started to date other people during that time, I made sure that I wasn't going to put myself in that situation again, that I, and I thought it was me, like I did something wrong when it was all about this perpetrator looking for someone to attack who was weaker than they were and putting it into perspective. But it was a lot of my own reading and being centered in myself that I kind of went, got through that. But other people that that would happen to uh, may be screwed up a long time because of that type of a situation. And it's even societal because I've read accounts of men growing up that are now in their 60s and 70s who may have been attacked or raped or molested or whatever, who when they did report it, they got jeered at, you mm -hmm. know, and they were actually like, they were actually told by rape crisis centers, like this is for women. If you come any, I read an account actually, seriously, not that long ago. If you come anywhere near this crisis center, we're going to report you because we've got women here who have reason to fear you because you're a man. You know, like that was like the thinking back then, like you couldn't be a man and have this actually happen to you. So we've, I, I, well, at the same time, we, we have come a long way in at least, you know, addressing that, you know, rape is rape and whatever, it's being attacked is being attacked. There shouldn't be any kind of a gender difference when it comes to that or, you know, yeah. any type of individual difference. An assault on you is an assault on you, period. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that, Robert. Yeah. I really that's uh, sharing your heart like that because that helps exactly. a lot of people that are watching this um, this show right now. And, you know, and all of this feeds into body image. All of it. So when you are violated, as your body is violated, um, you then have a body image. It just you. It just happens sure. whether you're male or female, and then that creates this whole unfolding of how that's going to happen within you of attacking your own body because you somebody has I, attacked your body. I felt weak. I felt. Uh, you know, just weak and vulnerable. And as a man, I didn't know how to handle, how do you handle weak and vulnerable as a man? I'm not supposed to be weak and vulnerable. So, right. you know, it's a dichotomy that you look at yourself going, this shouldn't be me. I shouldn't feel this way. So I could either deal with the emotional side or deal with the physical side. I kind of was lucky enough that I dealt with both because again, I don't like to think that I'm, uh, you know, in any way more evolved than anybody else, but from, from just, I, I knew, you know, having, a sister who had issues and women that I knew who were abused, I kind of, and talking with them through how they felt when things like this happened to them, um, I kind of knew for myself, you know, uh, what to kind of do because I, they, they would have conversations with me. And as gay men, I think we have women seem to open up and talk to us more than they would to a straight male who may not understand the emotional side where I think we're uh, gay men for some reason are a little bit more in tune to that, their feminine side in a little way, not, not, being, you know, general, and I don't know our generalization, but we can identify, I think, with, with straight women and, and they're, as they date men and we date men, uh, some of the same issues come up. Uh, so I think I was able to kind of deal with it through the help and support of my female friends, because I certainly wasn't going to go to a male friend to have this tough, this conversation or a straight male friend or my brother or my dad or anybody else. I, I asked my women friends who I knew had had these types of issues and then we just sit up and, you know, have a pint of haagen -Dazs and, you know, and just go through the, you know, the, the issues at hand. That's and you know it's that and you're eating right out of the pint. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> So. Oh, you know, I wish somebody had told me years and years and years ago that we have this really ugly voice in our head, this really negative, ugly voice, which I call ego voice, that just tears us apart. And it can, it can just rip your life apart and, and tear you down uh, from the beautiful being that you are. And your body image and food all play a role with this voice. And so getting that out and knowing that, you know, that this, you don't have to listen to this voice anymore. You don't have to listen to it. You, you, what you have to find is the beauty that you are. And then teach your children 
and, and get that word out to little ones so that they are not growing up listening to this horrible voice that is so self-destructive. I, I look at that, you kind of see that sometimes on, unfortunately, it's just, it's become politicized a little bit when you see how some men, you know, some women are working, you know, in, in the, and there's stay-at-home dads now and how stay-at-home dads are kind of sometimes belittled a little bit because, you know, they're not the breadwinner anymore and they're taking care of, care of the children and they're having those, those more emotional relationships that the mother used to have with the kid uh, mm -hmm. or with children at that time. And it's strange how even they can be belittled. You know, there's jokes made about them on television, on sitcoms and things uh, that sometimes they're looked at as less than uh, and, and how they grow up. But we really need to continue to encourage men to have those emotional relationships with their children. And the good thing is I look at my brothers and how they raise their kids and, and my nieces and nephews and our nieces and nephews and how, and how I see the difference on how I was raised. And, you know, it's nice to see that some of that has changed, uh, you know, and, you know, my dad was one of those guys who came home from work and expected dinner on the table at six o'clock in the evening. And, you know, we kind of sat there, we all ate together, we had polite conversation with one another, dishes were cleaned up, we got up, we put things away, mom would wash and clean the dishes, or my sister would help her, the boys were expected to go do boy things, and, you know, be with dad or go out and play basketball with him. Uh, but it was a whole other way of looking at it. Now, everybody, you know, their boys and girls pitch in to do things. You know, the, the kids, the boys know how to cook uh, and are interested in, in cooking and doing things that we just wouldn't, you know, if my if I would have played with an easy bake oven when I was a child, <laughs> it would have gone over well. But having, having some of my nephews, you know, going out there and helping their sister bake a pie or something like that in an easy bake oven or something of this nature, they don't frown upon it. And it's nice to see that evolution. Uh, mm -hmm. There just needs to be more of it uh, so that this this chain can break. But I think that the that the mental side of it, you know, what the research side is going to take a couple of generations for some of that research to filter yeah. down to actual in practice, you know, uh, for what we know. Because again, it's a generational, like you said, it's, it's how you were raised, is how you tend to raise your children by and large, uh, or at least bits and pieces of it. And unfortunately, some of these gender roles still stick with that, and that does hurt their 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 boys. The, and gender, their role, the gender role thing is so pervasive, I think. And I mean, I can my own personal experience. I, I've told Robert these stories too. I can share, but I remember, um, for instance, you know, I've always loved to cook and even bake. I've gotten better at the baking, um, but I've always loved both of those things. And I remember as a kid one time um, helping my grandmother cook in her kitchen and she, and she was like kind of like why do you like doing this you should you shouldn't want to do you know don't do this <laughs> yeah you know like that that reinforcing like there's something wrong with me because i like cooking and baking you know i remember i used to love drawing pictures as a young kid and i actually had a lot of i could sketch at a very young age i used to love to sketch animals and i would show it to my parents and everything and while they encouraged it i remember my dad one time making a comment to me that, um, well, it's okay that you draw on all that stuff, Mark, but just don't be majoring in it in college. Don't think you're gonna be majoring in that in college. You know, it was like the same thing with Robert and the ice skating. So, you know, it's like, it, it makes you grow up, feel, you know, feeling like, like, oh my God, am I this weird person? Am I this bad person? Because I like this this thing that is supposed not supposed to fit me as a gender or whatever, mm -hmm. you know? So it, it's, it just- And, it's, and it stifles your soul. It really is yeah. soul crushing. And there's nothing worse in, in the work that all of us do is to see somebody's soul crushed. It's just so hard to sometimes get that back and get that light back once you lose it or it's or it's become so damaged. And, you know, that's, again, what you do on Enlightened World Network by helping people find that again is so important. Uh, it really is. It's necessary because there are a lot of, you know, damaged and dimmed lights out there that really need to shine again. And they can't do that unless their soul, you know, and their life begins to heal. And it's mm -hmm. so important. And again, this conversation, I think, is really important because I don't think, I think the male perspective on body image, body issues is so underplayed in the media. 
uh, and in general. So it's not a topic that uh, in all the male conversations I've had sitting around with my buddies drinking beer, male image has not been one of the topics that's ever come up in, you know, even against gay men. Maybe we'll talk about how we lifted to the gym and, hey, I'm getting pumped and all this kind of stuff, but we'll never talk about how does that make you feel about, you know, about being, you know, smaller than me by, you know, 20 pounds. You know, we don't go there. You know, it's just never talked about. It's nice to have Hopefully this is kind of, again, like a safe zone where people can listen to the information, hopefully digest some of it, see some of it in themselves and maybe start to make a change uh, for the better. Mm -hmm. I think that's so fascinating because any time, uh, generalization, many times when women get together, body image is brought up within the first 10 minutes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it would be like sitting down. How are you? You look amazing. I can't believe I've gained five pounds. I mean, literally <laughs> within the first 10 minutes. So for you guys, it just sort of is a non, non. It's just not talked about, you know, we don't talk about it at all. You know, the only thing we'll talk about, we'll talk, I mean, with, with our straight male people, you know, gay men, we'll talk theater, we'll talk, uh, you know, uh, politics, we'll talk maybe some more of the taboo subjects. Uh, but with our straight male friends and relatives, We'll get there and it's about sports. Did you watch the football game? Did you watch? And it's all glossed over, you know, body doesn't come into it. The only time body comes into it is, you know, hey, you fat S O, you know, you know, it's like, you know, want another beer or something. That's as close as we get to ever talking really about body at all with one another. The only thing that men will talk about is the women's bodies that they're either paired with want or whatever. We don't talk about our own. It's talked about women as objects sometimes more than, than ourselves. And that's why you see a lot of men who start to get larger as they age, you know, they want their women to remain thin as they were the day that they got married, but they can put on 50 pounds and it's supposed to be just okay with the woman that they, that they gain that weight. It's, it's a very strange dynamic. Um, but uh, uh, I see that a lot, you know, uh, unfortunately. I'm so glad, Ruth, to have this forum to talk about these subjects, you know, and to really what we're doing is deconstructing programming. It is so important. It's a great topic. And it was so good to see you guys talk about that last week. I think one of the things that resonated with me so much on the last time you did meet Mies Diner was uh, talking about how you were raised and the food that you ate and those habits that you had, like leaving food on your plate, not leaving food on your plate, having enough food to eat, not having it. You know, the, the, the likes and dislikes that your parents had and how that translates into how you started and, and how you reacted to food kind of resonated with me so much. And I found the topic so much more interesting and, and you know, having, listening to how you did it as women and how, you know, we looked at, I think as, as men completely differently um, was just something that, you know, kind of felt needed to be brought to light a little bit more because we just Definitely, don't hear about it. Uh, a little bit the same too. Yeah. At the same time. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a lot of similarities, but yeah. a lot of, uh, I think the gender role plays so much into how we perceive food, how we eat, what we eat, yeah. you know, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I was just thinking about memories that when I was really little, we went to a place called Nathan's in, in, uh, uh, I don't remember where it was, someplace in Long Island or Brooklyn. And um, so it's all Nathan's hot dogs. And yeah. Yeah, they still make them, right? yeah. <laughs> and, and, and we used to go there and have a blast. They had, you know, rides and all kind of things like that. And so for me, growing up, when I saw Nathan's, it was like, oh my God, I have to have it. It is this joyful memory of a hot dog and a french fry yeah. <laughs> and you really sit back and look at it and i'm like what is this you know i'm being driven by your memory <laughs> to eat a specific food and and then i was thinking about my mom and i were never close but there was one thing we always did when we went to the mall we shared a um one of those big pretzels the soft pretzels yeah. Love those. and <laughs> all my life i have been like I love soft pretzels. Why? Because it was this memory of doing something with my mom that was that stood out and it belongs, it's food. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I thought, wow, you know, I, uh, it is amazing how we are driven emotionally by memories with food and body image. 
That's true. Very true. I think that that happens too when you blend families and you have your traditions around Thanksgiving and what was served at Thanksgiving. And then the spouse grew up, you know, particularly in this day and age where somebody may be Latin and somebody grew up, you know, uh, as, you know, in in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, you know, on on the farm. And you have these two cultures coming together and you get to a holiday like Thanksgiving where food is a huge part of that day. And, you know, how do you plan a menu? Now for the family and people want those memories and and you know and if they don't have them it causes arguments and who's bringing what and you know to to the meal and to this you know it's it's funny how food can do that how it, how important it is to our lives and how we celebrate the fourth of july or how we celebrate christmas and what's served the christmas eve dinner and you know i wonder if that's why i love thanksgiving so much that's one of my favorite like we'll make, I'll make Thanksgiving dinner like several times a year. And I'm wondering <laughs> if that ties into, you know, the memories of sitting around and the Thanksgiving and me missing that, mm-hmm. that family, and me missing those grandparents and me missing yeah. those aunts and uncles that are gone now, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, I wonder, uh, that's a, I never thought about that. That's mm-hmm. great. Deb. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, and it's funny because I, I have this note up on my uh, desk over here from Jesus, it says, stop living from energetic memories and live from the truth. Very nice. What a journey in trying to do that, right? Stop (laughs) living from energetic memories and just stay in divine truth and stick with that. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. How nice. That's lovely. Love that. That is. Hmm. So I'm looking at the clock and it's an hour, which is, it's gone very quickly, gentlemen. I, I <laughs> so enjoyed having you on with us. So I'm going to say there may be something here. We might, you might be seeing the five of us again. <laughs> because I can think of so many other conversations I would love to have with you all. I think ageism with, you know, with, with <laughs> women and men and how we age differently and our views of things. And there's just so many things that I think talking with women is is amazing because we don't talk like this about ourselves i mean it was just talking with each other last night before we're doing the show today that we actually had to sit down and think about some of these issues and it's amazing when you think about them uh, how it brings things to the foreground and i think that's a there's some really good topics for i think people to look at out there uh, and how we relate with one another and these conversations that we should be having between men and women about how uh, on the same topic, but our views are so completely di- diametrically opposed sometimes. Right. I, I agree. And, you know, I always say knowledge is power, but awareness is also power. Absolutely. And it's how we're going to break the cycles of all of this, of, of our body image and the things Absolutely. that are, you know, are the, the, what we see as differences in these human bodies right. that we're in right. Right. and get more to the, the point of where we see ourselves with our worthiness yeah. and seeing how worthy we are instead of being so critical of ourselves. God, so, God. yeah, I, I agree with all of that, that, mm-hmm. you know, there's more conversations to be had. There's more topics that related to this that mm-hmm. really need to be brought out into the open in a real and raw way. And it's going to help everybody, not just That's us. Great. It'll help everyone. Yes. And I think that you need to all come back down to uh, Lester's Diner so we can all get all five of us in that picture there. There we go. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for having us on and allowing us to kind of maybe give. And again, it's, it's, it's a small male perspective, but still, you know, a male perspective, hopefully that will help enlighten some people. Absolutely. So, friends, thank you for being here with us at Mimi's Diner. And Mark and Robert, thank you. Deb and Terry, thank you. And we will see you all later. You all have a great rest of the day. You too. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you.